Okay, it's working. Hey, I'm, I'm getting ready to disappear. I just want to make sure it was up and running. Oh, so good to see you. Good to see you, beautiful. Oh, could you, oh, would you help us with the framing? Would you tilt down so there's not so much headroom on Miss Ruth? Oh, yes. Just a little bit. There's two. Uh oh. I may have to put something under it. Is yeah, that, it's, I know. I've let me, got. Let me go get something under it. I've turned into a professional in figuring out how to make household items turn into my. Oh, hi, Miss Ruth. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Just, oh, a little bit depressed because of being in the house three or four months. Mm. Cooped up. I know. I know. Okay. Wait a minute. Is that too much, Hannah? Um, let me see. And Miss Ruth, I'm, how are you going to sit? Are you sitting like that? That's, if you could I'm sit up, back, whatever's comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's Maybe perfect. Is she too far back, Hannah? I need to bring it up closer. No, that framing. Will you speak for me, Miss Ruth? I just want to see how the audio is. Hi, Anna. Hi. Actually, take it a little bit closer, and I think that'll just help with the audio, but otherwise, it looks really good. Okay, Mommy, your legs under there? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. You look beautiful. Well, thank you. So, is oh. that good, Hannah? The frame? See, that's, per that's perfect. Honestly, I need you guys to teach the other people I interviewed. This looks so good. <laughs> All right. Oh, Miss Ruth, it's so good to see you. So I was wondering, I've been thinking about you because you are so productive. How have you been doing having to be cooped up? And I've been doing fine. I'm a little bit, uh, of course, a little bit depressed. You know, this is the state fair season. Yeah. Not able to participate in the last 32 years. First time in 32 years I haven't participated. So it was a little Texas OU with my favorite day and I, had to shed a few tears. <laughs> oh, I, I yeah. thought about you. Yeah, the game was a heartbreaker, but uh, I'm, I'm still here. Are you, are you enjoying the relaxation at all or no? Am I what? Enjoying the relaxation oh, at all. Yes, yes. I, I think, uh, you know, Hannah, I, I really am. I should have uh, retired a long time ago, according to the law of average, but <laughs> really, I've had to ad adapt, just accept it as God's will <laughs> and say, I'm going to go ahead with it. Try to wait for a vaccine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, the um, reason, the reason I want to talk to you, I've been thinking about you anyways, and I'm always so happy to talk to you, but I wanted to talk to you because you have spent decades registering people to vote, telling people the importance of voting. And then I'm watching these record numbers come in. So I wanted to talk to you about that. Right, right, right. You know, I'm just delighted to see the long lines. Um, every day I get up watching and seeing what's happening. Wake up in the morning with Morning Joe and Fox and Friends and CNN. I'm on all channels. But uh, you know, Hannah, uh, aside from just being delighted with the uh, long lines, it brings back uh, lots of memories and it's kind of a bittersweet type thing because uh well you know back in the day before the voting rights act in 1965 we had a hard time trying to get uh for the right to vote and standing in line at that time meant a different whole different ball game than this mm -hmm. i can remember um linda johnson i think signed the voting rights act in August of 65, I had planned to uh, attend the march from Selma to Montgomery. And of course, I was pregnant at the time. March 7 was the march and I had Renee, my second daughter, on the 22nd of March, so I couldn't attend. I'll always remember that and regret I, I couldn't. But, uh, you know, since that time, I've just uh, tried to encourage everybody, we just gotta, Gotta keep pushing. What I think young people, um, if you didn't live through something, it's so easy to take it for granted. Can you, before the Voting Rights Act, can you tell, what was it like? What was, oh, oh Anna. actually, you know, of course, discrimination, violence, uh, beatings, and anything to keep wealth really deter you from voting. Uh, 
I began uh, becoming deputized as soon as we, you know, got the Voting Rights Act to register and trying to register voters. I, I lived in Houston for the last what, the 12 years from 1955 till 1966. And uh, we would set up tables outside uh, Wine Garden grocery store, Hickey and Pilot down in Houston. And, uh, you know, try and register all we could. I even uh, wrote the uh, poll tax receipt for people. We had to have a poll tax, that was a requirement. And we even had to count the, or uh, estimate the number of jelly beans in a jar. I mean, yes, yes, you had to. Oh, we had literacy tests. And can you imagine back then, somebody uh, <laughs> just coming out of slavery and stuff like that, and you asked them to, to recite the Constitution of the United States? Those were very few people. Well, we just gave you it. Some gave up, didn't try to vote. But we had to, uh, that, that was my job. That's been my job to encourage people. Whatever it takes, we shall overcome. Ms. Ruth, how did, I, you know, it's so easy in life to get discouraged on any level. And I can't imagine living in a country that I call home that, when I walk up to somewhere to vote, that's how I'm treated. Why, where did, why didn't you give up? And where, where, did your parents teach you that? Where did this love come from? Well, you see, I guess, well, in a way my parents did. They never taught me racism or anything. My mom and dad had seven daughters, no boys. And uh, we were never, they never discussed racism too much. In fact, of course, my being almost 87 years old, you know, three months from 87. So, you know, mom and dad were way back. Well, you, you, you more or less was taught to, to accept this more or less as it was the law, you know, and, and, and you just uh, had to deal with it. And until we, uh, we could uh, actually, like I said, try and overcome. So by my uh, realizing that this, this was just, this was a life in those days. Uh, I just, well, mom and dad, uh, well, I have to say that they were an inspiration because like many uh, young people my age then, we owned our own property, we raised our own food, we were never in uh, the relief lines or own food stamps or ration, you know, that kind of thing. So I just felt like, well, and we were able to go to school. My dad, uh, even though he had no boys to help him uh, on the farm there, we uh, all went to college, all seven. And uh, like I said, in the 50s and 60s, it wasn't so hard. We had realized that this was just a, a, you know, this was a law of the land. And once uh, slavery and that type thing was uh, prohibited and abolished, then we just go from there. You know, to tell you the truth, I, I guess I could just call myself <laughs> an amendment. You know, we, we were, slavery was abolished uh, because of an executive order executive order by the president, Abraham Lincoln. And uh, from that point, uh, actually only the men could uh, really, you know, were really recognized. And then uh, only three fifths of a person more or less. But uh, at uh, the same time, we, we just had to, to keep fighting, keep pushing, keep praying and uh, Things happen by amendments, you know, 13th, 14th, 15th. So we were from three fifths of a person to uh, working, still working on the whole. Yeah, this is, and this is kind of off topic, but I just, I love talking to you and I, I want to go down all of these avenues. I have so many questions. But, you know, mm -hmm. one thing we're seeing right now 
is I think people are looking back at history um, and they're looking at it with fresh eyes and they're looking at these contradictions, this, the land of the free that enslaved so many, um, the constitution that's revered across the world that did not look at you as a person. Right. And a lot of people are getting angry um, at, it's, there's almost a feeling that some people are throwing away, I don't wanna say throwing away, but they're angry at all of the ideals that America's founded on. And then others are saying, no, you had to take that idea and over time it expanded to be the, what it was supposed to be, to actually apply to every human, man, woman, no matter their color. What is your viewpoint on that? Or have, have you, it's hard to articulate, but do you know what I'm saying? Have you witnessed kind of this, it's almost like a reckoning a little bit? Yes, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I, um, I have a lot more hope now. I see that, you know, before, just to, to tell you the truth, before the George Floyd uh, acts, uh, tragedy, mm -hmm. uh, I had a different feeling toward uh, even police brutality. Mm. And Hannah, when I, when I watched each night as the, the protest uh, in, across the nation, almost across the world, then I had renewed hopes because there were so many, not only black people in the protest, there were so many white outstretched arms, not only white, just all colors. And this, this gives me hope that somebody else actually kind of feels my plight or sees what has happened. And, and so this, hey, this just gave me so much encouragement. I'm, I'm feeling good right now. I really am. Isn't Ooh. that, I love to hear that. And isn't that when you said, somebody else sees my plight and recognizes it isn't that what we all want and so many people deny it to the other person to recognize if you have a different skin color or you're a different gender to people don't want to recognize that pain in somebody else and that's what we all are begging for right you don't know how i uh... What it does for me to even have you talking to me in this see that's what we need people to talk to each other to to understand each other uh, i wish i'm uh, hoping that uh, we could maybe in in police reform maybe have classes in police community relations so that uh, even the the the, the new recruits and the Police Academy could be maybe assigned to uh, assigned to some of the housing project, recreation centers, and that type of thing, and have little uh, spend time with the with the young men and boys, uh, black men and boys, because they seem to be in a they seem to be oh in a category all to themselves that they, they're not understood or not looked at as really, you know, sometimes really human beings. So I think that if, if we had more interaction with the, uh, with the police and the young black men and boys, that things would be different because they grew up with each other. The police would know the community and that kind of thing. That, that's yeah. what I'm for. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you see this, um, in scripture, but it's this idea, and this is what I love about journalism, this idea that when you know somebody, to know somebody is to love them. And it doesn't mean you agree, but when I know your story, when I listen to you, all of a sudden, I can't discount, there's a connection. To know somebody is to love them, I feel like. Exactly, right, right. How many, how many people do you think you've helped to register to vote um, since you've been on planet Earth? Oh, I can't even, I couldn't even imagine. Really, that was my job. It, well, part of my job, in, 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 especially in Houston, 
In fact, now, since I've been in Dallas, I have not really uh, been deputized every year, but in Houston every year, I went and deputized uh, to uh, register voters. And that was just even with, if I had to, up until taking them to and fro to the polls. Yeah, we just, uh, my husband and I were always just involved. If yeah. you had, if you had to guess, if you had between your husband and yourself, if you had to guess, ballpark. Oh, uh, I, oh, heck. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the thousands, I'll tell you. I've met lots of people. Well, and really not actually met them, but to actually just year after year to um, sit in parking lots all day on Saturdays or that type thing and, and actually register people and uh, go down to the, right, right now I have, uh, I go by the elections uh, at, uh, administration building, pick up uh, uh, voter registration cards, take them back to the place or wherever I work so that everybody go by the post office, pick up a handful. Yeah, just, just always. So I, I just wouldn't know it'd be a thousand, in the thousands. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. what would your husband say if he could see the turnouts right now? Oh my word, I know he's just turning over right now. <laughs> yes, he would love it. Now this would be a, a sight to behold for him. You know, Adolf was very, uh, oh heck. He, he was always running for something. <laughs> it was either the city councilman, the, 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 the senator. No, he, he ran for it. Well, Adolf was the first, uh, I, I, and I think the only person who ran against Eddie Bernice Johnson back in 19, must have been, well, it's the 30th district when Texas uh, uh, attained the uh, 30th district. Adolf ran against Eddie Bernice Johnson. And uh, he served on the city plan commission uh, here in Dallas for, oh, some six or eight years. I did all the work, <laughs> really. I carried the, uh, the business on and uh, actually just worked alongside and we didn't have as much time to, to write, uh, to register voters, but we always was there to take them to and from the, polls to vote or that type thing, any protest or anything like that. We were always right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, he would love it. What would you say to the people that say, you know, I don't like either guy. All politicians are crooks. It doesn't matter. What would you say to those people that say, I, I don't need to participate? Well, actually, like I said, now we've never really just voted uh, for a party. Now yeah. we always looked at the guy and their principles and that type thing. And, and I would tell that same person, look at the person. I mean, see, you know, whether he's a, what, whatever the party, let's let's go with the principles and, and that type thing. We, we check, the, check the guy. You know, you know what's interesting? You were talking about um, in the 50s, how it was just the law of the land and it was legal to have you count jelly beans to prove your right to vote. That's, that was a law. And the only way to change law is to get that vote out. And that, I think that's what we're seeing, seeing right now. And that's how change is slow. It's painstakingly slow. But it's because people like you showed up and fought for that right to vote that it's now illegal and absurd to have somebody count jelly beans in order to right. vote. Well, see, it was people like, and it was people like Lyndon Johnson and Martin Luther King and John Lewis and those type people. And even see the whites, then there were people who had a change of heart. So you can, you know, you have to, you can't change anything by knocking down statues and that type thing. You have to work on the heart and the mind. And, and like I said, uh, I know that the George Ford incident, the tragedy was horrific, but honestly, I think it touched hearts. It touched minds. I think they could actually see. What do, you, do you have any advice for individuals 
moving throughout the world on how, because we're in this moment where I think people are looking at the other, whatever that is, as an enemy. Do you have advice for how to change hearts or how to keep your own heart open, especially in emotional times and especially when you're talking to somebody that you disagree with? You have to keep that open mind. And, and like I said, the more people get to know each other, um, yeah, we, we, we've got to talk to each other. I can, you can't just look at me and judge me by my color. We need to get to really know each other and love each other. Um, that's, that's the only way we're going we're gonna to do it. Uh, to my kids, uh, I just urge them to vote, to, to be aware of, of what, of, of everyday, everyday happenings. What, of, look at, don't just go to work and come back home. Let's uh, be involved. Let's, let's be involved with what's happening around us and uh, check out the different, uh, uh, the, the leadership roles, check that person out. Let's, let's be sure um, that we are aware of what is happening around us each and every day. And then we've got, we've got to do a lot of praying, really, really. I bet. History did, didn't really tell us everything. My, my, my oldest daughter, in fact, Gwen, who you met, Gwen didn't really know what the poll tax uh, meant. She, did, she knew, or she didn't really know that I had even uh, written the receipts for people or to sell well the poll tax were dollar fifty really and at that time in, in nineteen fifty or people really didn't a dollar fifty cents was a lot of money mm -hmm. yeah because uh, but uh, just grow up uh, being involved you just can't uh, just can't be out there with being an empty vessel no let's let's become involved yeah yeah it's funny you say that about the poll tax because i have an idea of what it is but i wrote down a note to myself to look it up after it, speaking with you it was right in there with the uh with the jelly beans and the literacy test and then now this uh, was peculiar to the various states some states were a little more lenient so but then there are some, especially now those in the South, the, they were pretty, pretty cruel. Yeah. And Ms. Uh, like I said, Mr. The thing that strikes me, and I've just got a few more questions, but the thing that strikes me about you is at least from my, what I observe, you're not bitter and you're hopeful and you're solution oriented and you seem to look for the good. And listening to your story, I would say that you, if you wanted to be bitter, you have every reason if that's what you wanted. And that's, that's the way I've always felt. You know, and just thinking of my situation now, when I was a little girl, um, like I said, I was in the country, on the farm, and, and never dreamed of, uh, never, never dreamed of coming to a segregated state fair uh, at 10 and 11 years old and having one day, of course, you know, we had one day to attend the fair. Most schools are most, yeah, one day. But uh, anyway, I enjoyed that, looked forward to it every year. And mom and dad would get me those new shoes and that little new outfit. And really, that was never, never had any reason to really know. They'd never taught us bitterness. And then we knew that we had uh, 16, 17 years of school. We had to go to school, grade school, and then we had to attend college, because that's the only way you're going to get ahead. You had to be, Mama always said, you need to be better than the next one, be better. And so that's, that's what we always, that, that's the feeling I've always had. Then I got here, come from that little one day at the state fair on Negro Day to becoming the queen of the state fair. Can you, can't believe it, you know? So this gives you hope. 
you just have to get in there and, and keep then you meet people like Juan and Brent and that kind of thing and and uh, they keep you young <laughs> yeah we just yeah I'm still looking forward to more good days mm -hmm. oh that they're on the way um yeah what do you why do you think we're seeing this yeah I agree with you that George Floyd was a was a moment that changed hearts um but why this but why do you think because i think people were getting almost resting on their laurels when it came to voting and saying oh somebody else will do it whatever why in this moment do you have any theories about why we're seeing engagement on the levels that we're seeing right now oh I have to say, you know, like I said, you have to look at the leadership. And of course, all the, we've had quite a bit of chaos. Chaos. The past, this whole, oh, this past four years, it's been chaotic with the COVID-19 coming in, with the judge floor, with, oh, just so many things. I have just been pulled and torn and and in prayer and, in so, oh i'll tell you it, it's 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 been a horrible time for me really at my age and all afraid to go out without my mask and and so i, I don't know i just it, it's it's hard to hard to really just put your finger on why people lost it seems like they lost a little hope like you said, you know, we just kind of relaxed, and uh, and I'm I'm exhausted. I really am. It's just kind of exhausted. So, but you can't give up. No, you can't give up. That's why I'm so delighted to see such long lines. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what forever what we have to, or even even maybe more. Uh, <laughs> more people to more size to vote for, whether it's Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, uh, Independent, whatever. Uh, I'm still just happy to see these these long lines. When you see people wait in eight and ten hours, that reminds me of myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. But then I see hope. It, that brings back the hope. Yeah. Right. You know, you've, you've been on this planet for a few more years than me. Have you ever seen this kind of excitement when it comes to voting? No, never in my life, never. In fact, I've never had a year like this. I've never seen, uh, never had an experienced time. Just never have. And it's, it's probably all for a good reason. You know, Mama always said, uh, uh, bad start makes a good end. So we, we just, we we're going we're to just keep hoping. We've got what, 19, 18 more days before we go into it. Um, two more questions. One is local elections. Any suggestions to people on how to, I think a lot of people know what the president gets all the the media attention and then people go into these the ballot booth and they don't even know who they're voting for down ballot how well, important I, is it to research that i uh i have well I, I stress that the most that i can tell them in the, the uh, i stress that you know the government it most importantly begins at home right and at home you have to start with your local government you have to know the, the mayor and the city council people and that type thing. Uh, and for the most part, well, I don't know. I, I've always stressed that. You, you can't just go in there and vote. And there are a lot of people who, oh, I, I just vote for the president or I just vote during the presidential election. Oh my God, what's going to happen with those other three years? You know, uh, so that, I, I stress that, I've always, yeah. Yeah, my kids always. My last question is, 
when you say your prayers, what is it that you've been, what are you praying for? What have you been praying for? Really, peace. And we need, we need peace. The, there's so much chaos. Um, I, I just, like I said, I, I'm just exhausted. It's on all, all sides. We have police brutality here. We have protesting here. We all, oh, it's just like I've never seen. So I just ask God that, that, uh, that we can have peace, peace. And I've always been called the peacemaker. <laughs> That's what uh, Smoky John always called me, the peacemaker. I never liked uh, the chaos and mm -mm. we need, we need peace. Well, I, I think I've heard before, blessed are the peacemakers. That's, that's me. He always said, oh, the truth, you good. I'm just a peacemaker. But <laughs> I love peace. I, I really, I do. I love everybody. And if I could just see us come together. You know, the only time that I really, I think I even posted that, that I wish one morning we could feel or like we did uh, after 9-11 was the first time that I really saw even the members of Congress, all 538, the Republicans, the Democrats, all come to the Capitol steps and join hands and uh, sing God Bless America. Oh, that was so touching and I'll never forget it. Never. You know, we can be, we can disagree, but we don't have to be disagreeable. We, we just, just gotta, we gotta love each other. I've gotta love a Republican, love a Democrat, whoever. It doesn't matter. These are all human beings. Mm. We just have to find a way to live together, love each other, and make it through this terrible time. Well, if I can give you one small gift before we end this interview, it's that I have been going to the polling locations to be you know, as a journalist to cover it. And we went to one where the line was two and a half hours long. It wound around. And that line, it was old, young, fat, thin, people in wheelchairs, people standing, black, Hispanic, Asian, white. And the energy was so positive. And so, and there just felt like there was this pride that everybody had that everyone was participating and voting for what they want the future to look like. There was a come, there was a peace. That is the word in that moment, in that moment, but that's a start. God. It was, it's, it's a beautiful sight. I'm just thinking back that I saw people who even brought their lawn chairs and the books and the bags with the lunch and all that type thing. It, it is beautiful. You know, Hannah, I, uh, like I said, you know, we have we have our certain uh, affiliations and that kind of thing, and, and I, I like with Smokey Johns and the boys, and I tell them all the time, you know, I said, look, we have to love everybody. We make our living with from our customers. We have to love our customers. You know, we can't. You you uh, no. So that's that that takes a. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you have to be, be careful and discreet uh, in how you treat people. You have to love people, we, you know. It, you don't want to alienate. It's so funny you say that my mom's a small business owner. And yeah. it, it just purely from a business sense, her mentor, oh. this woman named May that took, they own a furniture store in Kansas, but her mentor said to her, purely from a business sense. I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, you don't, because those are your customers. And whatever you do, you're gonna cut out half of them. So. That's exactly what I'm saying. Those are yeah. your customers. And, and, and like I said, I just thank God that I've gotten where I am and accomplished what I have, what little it might be. Uh, and like I said, those people, 
anybody's money is all green and that's what you need. <laughs> yes. You can't get there and alienate anybody. And I tell the kids uh, that the boys, uh, hey man, these, this is our livelihood. So yeah. we have to do what we need to do and uh, take care of our business. Take care of our customers, customer service, the main and most important thing in the business. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Ruth, thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, Hannah, I, I'm so pleased. I just think about uh, last year, and that was one of the times that I was really surprised in my life. <laughs> I've only been really surprised two times when the, the girls, uh, my daughters, gave me a second retirement party, and I, I had no clue. And then when you did the Rise and Shiner, I had no clue that it was more or less about me. Juan and Brent said that, that, that uh, I think, I'm trying to see what, what story they gave me. I think it was that someone wanted to uh, check out the procedures at the restaurant and all, and that's why I was coming in at the, uh, came in, I can't, for, can't remember the photographer's name. But Cody, anyway, it was Cody. This, he loved Cody. Cody, yeah. Cody, and I loved him too, we fun. But this is why Cody was coming in at three o'clock in the morning with me, and, and I, I just thought it was beautiful. And then when it ended up, all my family came, oh my God, I was speechless. I was just speechless. Yeah, I was surprised. Oh, uh, that was, that, that was, um, it, I mean, true, that was a gift for me. That I, I learned from your life, and it, I mean, that, that's not work, that's joy, you know? Well, it, it is, and you know, I, I have never been, uh, yeah, I'd never be a journalist or a public speaker or anything like that. And even in the business, Juan and Brent were always out front. You know, I was just in the back kind of uh, behind the scenes person making it happen, you know. But uh, I, like I said, I've never, never been a talker. I was just, I'm a doer. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. yes. And I think we can, I think we can learn from that. I do. Well, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I kind of, I enjoy, I've had a wonderful life. I really have. And well, this.